Okay, this is Richard Haydarian with a very nice Armenian name, and he's an expert on uh, all things Indo-Pacific, I guess, uh, author and uh, I guess a professor even um, or some such. So uh, thank you for, for talking to me, Richard. I really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, first of all, can, can you just tell me a little bit about you? You wrote a book about the Duterte presidency. How did that presidency differ from the current presidency with the son of uh, Ferdinand Marcos? Right. Thank you very much, uh, Chuck. That's a very great American name. <laughs> so, um, well, as far as the uh, Philippines is concerned, I mean, overall, it's, it, it has had one of the wildest and more fiesta-like democracies uh, anywhere in the world. And you just look at the wild swings in terms of the predisposition of different presidents, just in the recent memory, just in my own lifetime or in my adult life, I've seen like really, really different kind of predisposition from different kind of presidents. And inevitably, these wild changes in the domestic uh, uh, orientation of different presidents has also had huge implications for the Philippines foreign policy. I would confidently say, as someone who has also written a book on the Indo-Pacific and the broader region, I can confidently say that at least in the ASEAN, no, at least in the ASEAN, you won't find any other country who has had, you know, such uh, such such differing approaches, uh, you know, to to the U.S.-China uh, dynamics, U.S.-China competition in the region. I mean, it is true that most of the ASEAN countries hedge, and you know, as I put it, I don't know if this is politically correct to put it, but as I say, when it comes to ASEAN, we have fifty shades of balancing and hedging, right? So no two countries are alike. In the Philippines, no two administrations are alike, right? So if you look at uh, former President Duterte, he really marked a major departure uh, from the traditional approach to Philippine foreign policy, which essentially treated America or our alliance with America as sacrosanct. But at the same time, he was not also totally different from some of the earlier presidents. For instance, he got a lot of inspiration from former President Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, who, when she had problems with the Bush administration, actually also started her own strategic flirtations with China. But what, of course, makes uh, Duterte different is not only the strategic orientation, but the language that he used in order to recast the Philippines' foreign policy. The other thing that also made the Duterte presidency a critical juncture in Philippine foreign policy and Philippines politics in general is that it also happened amid the tremendous rise of China and accordingly also the rise of the Trump presidency, which in itself mm -hmm. upended America's approach. So you had a very wild, chaotic, uncertain environment and Duterte was very much responding to the demands of the moment from his own, uh, from his own perspective. But as I always say, as much as there are wild swings, there's always an element of continuity. It's not as obvious, but there is. And that element of continuity is the strong preference for strong ties with the United States as far as the Philippine public is concerned and as far as the Philippine defense establishment and strategic elite is concerned. That has not gone away. So even when Duterte really tried, popular president, really tried to reorient the Philippines towards China, he really struggled. And that is why, if you look at my writings, you know, thousands of them throughout the years, I always remain relatively confident that the break with the United States is not going to come, that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be some sort of a tense relationship like never before. But I, I expected the fundamentals of that alliance to hold in the same way that I was always skeptical about his pivot to China. I felt that pivot to China is not sustainable because there's no domestic con constituency for that. And the veto players, the military, the top officials in the foreign ministry, among others, were always deeply skeptical of China. And of course, China didn't make things easy for the Philippines because I always said, forget about debt trap, it's pledge trap. China offered billions of dollars of investments to the Philippines in 2016, 24 billion to be specific. Barely a billion came in over the next six years. So that's important because when Marcos Jr. came in, he had to deal with a situation whereby essentially China was not delivering on any, any of its uh, promises. And Duterte was not successful in making the Filipino people more skeptical of U.S. in favor of China, right? And then, of course, there was a Russia element which got complicated with the war in Ukraine because Duterte was also flirting with Putin to try to create another front so that he's not, he's not dependent either on China too much or traditional allies. 
So this is where Marcus Jr. comes in. And if you look at Marcus Jr., I always said he's going to be more like his own father, Marcus Sr., who had a very astute foreign policy. I mean, we can talk about his horrible human rights record, his terrible mismanagement of the economy of the Philippines. No debate about that. The facts are clear. But on foreign policy, Marcus Sr. was a master. I mean, he was a, he, his statecraft, I think, was second to none as far as the, in fact, Philippines is concerned, but in fact, even by regional standards. So if you look at Marcus Sr., for instance, um, he kept the alliance with the United States very strong. He extracted a lot of strategic rents from America for the basing access in Subic and Clark, the largest overseas American bases. But, but very interestingly, he was among first U.S. allies to normalize bilateral relations with Maoist China. In fact, the first persons he sent to normalize ties with Maoist China, literally Maoist China, were his wife, Imelda Marcos, and his son, Marcos Jr. So you'll see all these pictures of Mao Zedong, you know, hugging Marcos Jr., the, you know, the heir apparent and crown prince of the Philippines back then. But the other thing also with Marcos is that he actually leveraged ties even with old Filipino communists, communists to build ties with Romania, with the Eastern Bloc, and with the Soviet Union. So my sense always was the son will try to kind of imitate his father, except it has to be done for the 21st century, right? Because conditions are very different from back then. Now China is a superpower. Now China is clearly a threat to us in the South China Sea. So that's why I never, I was very skeptical about the claims of the opposition. A lot of people, liberal critics who were saying, oh, Marcos comes in, the Philippines is going to be a Chinese lackey. He's going to finish essentially what Duterte started. I was very skeptical about that. And clearly, uh, barely a year in, not only has Marcos not continued Duterte's pivot to China, which was not really sustainable for the, fa for the reasons I explained, but he has doubled down our alliance with, with the United States. But then again, it also has to do with China. So I constantly say, let's not forget that a lot of things the Philippines is doing is actually reactive or responding to China. In the case of Duterte, China didn't give him really anything. In the case of Marcos Jr., exactly the same. So in January, actually, Marcos had his first state visit, not to the U.S., not to Japan, but to China, outside traditional uh, neighbors you know, and partners in ASEAN. But China offered him nothing. I mean, if you look at the uh, joint statement between Philippines and China in January, uh, barely any mention of a major big ticket infrastructure project. All of those things he promised to Duterte, they didn't even bother to promise anything to Marcos Jr. Second, on South China Sea, almost zero concessions from China. So if you look at it, I don't think Marcos was like gung-ho to double down on the Philippines alliance with the U.S., although he loved the the charm offensive. I mean, in fairness, I think Marcos also had a change of heart because initially he was worried because, of course, Marcuses have pending cases in the U.S. courts. Marcuses have quite a baggage in the United States. But once Biden reached out to him, once multiple U.S. cabinet members visited the Philippines, he felt good. But he still tried to reach out to China, except China was not giving him much of love. So he was left with very few options because public opinion was very clear. We need to build the alliance with the United States. More than 70% of Filipinos in the survey said, we need to build the alliance with the United States. He's not getting much love from China when it comes to economic investments, infrastructure. So this is where I think he was much more open to proposals by the Philippine military, by the Pentagon, by traditional allies that, hey, maybe you got a better chance dealing with China if you have a stronger backup from us. Otherwise, what's your leverage with China? You cannot just get things out of China by just sweet talking them. That's never going to work with China. You have to have leverage. So I think Marcos doubling down our alliance with the United States is about deterrence, not taking sides, but deterrence, and also having some sort of bargaining chip. Because now that the Philippines has ETCA going forward, it can tweak the ETCA in order to get something out of China, right? So Prior to the EDCA, you know, decision, Philippines really didn't have much of a uh, leverage because China got everything it wanted. Duterte did not assert the arbitration award. Duterte did not implement the EDCA. Duterte was causing U.S. right and left. The best thing he did was to restore the VFA, Visiting Forces Agreement. So China was kind of happy with the situation. But now suddenly the Philippines is in a sweet spot because it can always say to China, hey, the EDCA implementation is not you know, a done deal in a sense that the number of exercises, the number of troops, where will the exercises be conducted? What kind of exercises are there going to be amphibious attack, HADR? You see, you can tweak that. It's, so the menu is there, but the ingredients that goes into it, you can tweak that. So in short, the Philippines now can leverage EDCA, tweak and twist it, 
to get something out of China. And if China doesn't offer us anything, we'll just keep on tightening the news around China by doubling down on alliance with the United States. And as I said, the big picture is very clear. Two trilateral alliances are coming together to keep China in check. AUKUS obviously is coming in, Britain, Australia, and US. But AUKUS will, is really a long-term deal, right? We're looking at 2040s when the new submarines are going to come in and a few Virginia-class submarines in the next decade or so. But the more important trilateral alliance is what I call JAFOS, Japan, Philippine, and United States. That's very important because we fear a war could happen in Taiwan in the next three, four, or five years, if not, if not earlier. So in short, this is all about deterrence. This is all about leverage, right? In, that's why I'm saying still expect some plot twists in the coming years. It, so it's not a done deal. It's not a done deal yet. And the Marcoses are masters of negotiation. You know, they played the U.S., they played the Chinese, they played the Russians throughout the Cold War. I won't be surprised they'll also play that game. In fact, presidential sister, I mean, Marcos is now emerging as one of the leading critics of, of ETCA. And the Chinese embassy is more or less, you know, um, citing her to defend their argument that this is provocative, right? So clearly, I, I don't know if this is intentional, good cop, bad cop, but just that just tells you what the Marcoses all, are all about. I'm not saying they're unreliable allies, but I, what I'm saying is that they're not, you know, unidimensional. They're not monolithic. You know, things are going to still come. Interesting things are still going to happen in the coming months and years. Again, depending on what China also offers and does. So is is China as strong as everybody really thinks, or is it actually weaker than, than most people think it is? Well, in terms of uh, operational capability, I think there's no reason to underestimate China. At the end of the day, China is a regional superpower. So in any showdown with the United States, it can concentrate all of its capabilities, asymmetric and conventional, while the U.S. is spread all across the world. In fact, if you look at real numbers, meaning you use purchasing power parity, not nominal numbers, the economy had very interesting numbers, which, which is probably China is spending $600 billion on its military, which is primarily regional. So U.S. can really not take on China on its own. It's going to be too bloody. It always had to be in coordination with other uh, partners and allies. So in terms of capacity, I think China has a lot to offer. Uh, but in terms of diplomacy, China it doesn't show a lot of sophistication because you always hear, oh, China, thousand years of civilizations. Like, no, what I'm seeing is a bunch of 12 year old guys almost like running the foreign ministry language. I mean, the rhetoric. I mean, just, just listen to the kind of complete nonsense that comes out of Chinese foreign ministry. I don't know if that's a reflection of uh, their irrelevance and crying for relevance because we know the foreign ministry really doesn't run anything in China anymore. Or this is actually just the tip of the iceberg that the, that the guys down there who are making the real decisions in the PLA, et cetera, maybe even more hawkish. That's why the foreign ministry guys are trying to catch up. So, so what I'm saying is that there is a huge gap between China's actual capabilities and economy, which is growing and growing, not as fast as before, but still the biggest, the biggest in the region. And then at the same time, the diplomacy, it's, it's, it's definitely lacks maturity. I mean, I would have said if China were really sophisticated, they would have offered two or three good projects in the Philippines. Let's say one billion dollars. It's not small, but for China, it's not that big. They could have turned the public opinion in the Philippines. But no, they could have a little bit been more judicious with their diplomatic language. But they're not. So, so something is going on here. We know what's going on, right? I mean, so this is a country whereby their capabilities went ahead of their diplomatic skills. And clearly, there's also a great sense of entitlement, a great sense of half-concocted victimhood. And I always tell my Chinese counterparts, you want to talk about 100 years of, you know, um, humiliation? Well, guess what? We in the Philippines had 500 years of humiliation, more than three centuries by Spanish and more than a century by Americans or so. And then you can put the Japanese and the rest in. So don't play that victim card because we're, we're, we're even bigger victims and we don't want to be also your victims. And they don't get it. So actually, the great strategist, uh, Edvard Lutfach, he had a term for it. Again, not political correct. He used, he used the term great power autism. It's a term that also Kosikan Bilahari, the very outspoken uh, Singaporean ex-diplomat, also uses. So what we notice is that China doesn't seem to understand very well the, 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 the nuances of domestic politics and how it shapes the foreign policy of countries like the Philippines. I think they thought the Philippines is just a giant Cambodia. They got their Hun Sen. Everything else will follow. Well, guess what? That's not how the Philippines works. The president is not as powerful as you think. It's a very American-style system, whereby the president, symbolically, is powerful, 
But there's so many veto players and so many behind-the-scenes negotiations going on there, especially on matters of foreign policy and defense strategy. Wow. Fantastic. Excellent. Hang on a second. Let me uh, – thank you very much for, for doing that. Thanks for, for coming on. I could uh, uh, talk to you for hours about this. Uh, you're, you're obviously just uh, exploding with knowledge on this area, and uh, that's very helpful for our, our viewers, so I appreciate it.